I'm Chad Main, the founder of Legal Services Company Recipient, and this is Technically Legal, a podcast about legal technology and innovation in the legal industry. In today's episode, we're talking about the current state of blockchain with attorney Lewis Cohen. He's with the law firm at DLX Law, a law firm specializing in blockchain and the crypto world. Blockchain and cryptocurrency are getting a lot of attention lately. There's no question that the technology is gaining traction and cryptocurrencies are gaining more acceptance among the general public. But with his increase in adoption comes more pushback from the old guard and more scrutiny from the government. I'm a big believer in blockchain and cryptocurrencies. I agree, there's a lot of hype and a lot of overzealous marketing surrounding the crypto world, but I firmly believe that blockchain technology is going to change the way we do a lot of things and change the way we interact with each other in the future. This is especially true for legal transactions. I feel like a lot of the pushback and mistrust of blockchain technology and cryptocurrency is that it's new, and it ain't always easy to understand. But you got to remember, cars freak people out at first, and I can only imagine what people thought of radios and electricity when they came out. And even fast forward to the modern day, the internet's not been around that long, and that took a minute to catch on. It's the opaqueness of blockchain technology is why I asked today's guest to come on the show. He's Lewis Cohen. He's one of the founders of DLX Law. It's a firm specifically set up to work with players in the blockchain world. Lewis explains how the technology works, and we also talk about some of the emerging use cases outside of cryptocurrency, like NFTs, non-fungible tokens, and DAOs, DAOs, which are distributed autonomous organizations, which may or may not be the business entity du jour in the future. He also talks about the legal implications of blockchain, and we finish our discussion with a talk about the current regulatory environment. Lewis started his career before the first Bitcoin was issued and before the blockchain was created, but he was an early adopter, and he believed in it so much he jumped ship from a successful career in Big Law to launch his law firm. I'd had a long career doing a number of different areas, but really focusing on innovative financial products. I was just fortunate as a junior lawyer to get involved in securitization very early. And I really you know, appreciated innovation in the context of being in a large law firm setting. And um, you know, we went through the whole financial crisis, and we, you know, there's just a lot of figuring things out. But when we kind of came out the other side of the kind of regulatory response to the financial crisis, particularly around securitization, I discovered blockchain and I thought, my God, this is really an incredible opportunity to sort of rethink the way our financial system works. Having and what just, year was this? What year uh, was this? 2015, 2015. And so I went to the managing partner at the firm I was at at the time, great guy, and um, I said, well, you know, there's this blockchain thing, and I, I think we should start a group. And he, he, you know, squirreled up his nose and looked at me and said, well, what are you talking about? I said, you know, blockchain, and Bitcoin, and Bitcoin. He said, <laughs> why don't you join the fintech group? I said, well, actually, yeah. I'm in the fintech group already. <laughs> this is different from fintech. It's a completely new thing. He's like, yeah, whatever. So eventually I persuaded um, him and I, I founded uh, the blockchain group at, at the large law firm I was at at the time. And, and we formed a group and a team. But it became clear to me that this was a space that was moving so quickly um, and so much was happening, so dynamic, that trying to do it in the context of a large law firm was just was almost completely hopeless. And there's no disrespect to the firm, which is a fantastic firm and still does great work in the space. But I, I felt like to move more quickly, we had to take it outside the large law firm setting. And I was fortunate to meet my co-founder, who unfortunately couldn't join us today, um, Angela Angelosca Wilson. She was the general counsel at um, a major uh, blockchain startup. And as we put our heads together, we said, you know, there's no one out there that's both experienced and has a lot of real world financial kind of experience and is deeply understands the blockchain space. And let's put those two things together and start a law firm kind of based on that. How did you meet Angela? So I met uh, pitching um, the company she was the general counsel for, Digital Asset Holding, uh, which is a was a major firm. It was actually where Blythe Masters, the well-respected banker, former JP Morgan banker, had when she left JP to go into blockchain, that was actually one of the things that really kicked off the whole kind of, wow, this is for real. And so um, at my law firm, being the head of the group, I said, well, I've got to go meet the general counsel of this really interesting company. And so we sat down and, and as we started talking, we realized there's a bigger opportunity. And so it's DLX law. I assume the DL is distributed ledger. Well, it's, a, it's an interesting story right there. We knew we didn't want to market ourselves under our individual names, because we really thought this, in the spirit of blockchain, this really isn't about individuals, it's about a community. 
And so we toyed with a lot of different names, and uh, Angela, to her credit, uh, came up with this idea. And, and so initially it was indeed distributed le- DL for distributed ledger, and the X was going to be a superscript. So it was going to be DL to the X power, like a you know an, you know uh, like an algebraic X a, a, as a superscript. And I loved this idea, and it was like really cool. And then we realized, holy moly, you know, <laughs> if, if if we're going to ask everybody to, to type our name with a superscript, you know, that's going to be the end of the world. So. The- <laughs> So we moved it down to a small X, but we were, were also we worked with a tremendous team, actually uh, people that Angela knew uh, from from Europe, um, to develop our logo. And if you look at our logo, you can kind of get the idea of the superscript X uh, kind of comes across in our logo. But that's the little story of our name. So you founded the firm in 2018 with Angela, and you've already alluded to it. You felt to serve the spirit of blockchain and, and those using blockchain, your blockchain clients, it needs to be different. And I read an article in... I think it was in Coindesk, actually. The article said they skewed the term partner because, in their view, it fosters a sense of possession over clients or cases. Instead, lawyers will assume responsibilities based on their skills, not seniority. What's the vision there? How does that work in the real world? A great quote. I'm glad you pulled that out. And it's still very much our ethos here. So, you know, if people look, we don't say partner on our business cards. We don't really, you know, refer to ourselves unless we, you know, absolutely need to as a partner. You know, we're all lawyers here and we're all kind of um, contributing, you know, in our own ways. We've kind of expanded and contracted a little bit over the three and a half years that that we've been around. But um, always, you know, with the view that everybody is contributing, you know, and according to their skill set and, you know, and, and interest level. We also very much early on, I think you, you may have read about this, saw ourselves as part of a, what we refer to as a constellation. So we saw, you know, as a smaller firm, as a boutique firm, the ability to kind of connect with others in this space, work with other law firms in a non-threatening way. And and we felt part, as part of our, our ethos as well is to, and we have very successfully worked with a number of both smaller firms and very large firms um, in a collaborative fashion, kind of coming in as subject matter experts in blockchain and digital assets and kind of complementing the work that other larger law firms do in areas that we simply can't cover. And I noticed too, as you should, you accept crypto for payment. How do you just the nuts and bolts without getting too much detail? How do you accept it? Like if you have a client that wants to pay it, how's it done? Well, the good news is there's not a lot of detail uh, to it. Uh, the one important caveat is that we do not accept crypto for retainers, and that's because that could look like a business relationship. Since a retainer payment is client funds, you know, to the extent Bitcoin, Ether, which is the main uh, cryptocurrencies that we accept, you know, can vary in value, and it could raise questions, particularly if it changes value. So, so we just do accept it for payments. In fact, we have a uh, account at one of the major uh, digital asset exchanges, and so we have simply a, an address that. That we get payments to. So we give them, if you wanted to pay us in, in Bitcoin, you would send Bitcoin to our address. We convert the amount in dollars that our, our fees are charged in. So let's say it's 10,000 US dollars. You know, we would convert that into Bitcoin at the time of payment. We would receive the payment in Bitcoin. And, and generally speaking, we just immediately flip it back into dollars since we operate in dollars and our expenses are in dollars. It's a convenience. One of the things, you know, that's interesting, Chad, that happened over time is that most of the people who are long Bitcoin or Ether don't want to sell. They don't want to pay. So so, so it really hasn't, I mean, we're delighted to do it. It's no, it's very little skin off our nose. We've had had clients that want to pay us in a quote unquote stable coin, or as the Federal Reserve likes to say, a so-called stable coin. So USDC, uh, the circle based coin, but we've accepted others. And that's actually a convenience as well, because then you can have pure dollar payment. 24 7 there's no bank wires there's no fees and that actually works pretty well also so we will accept a payment in usdc or another major uh stable coin as well you know let's just say the bill is a thousand bucks as we saw today i think bitcoin the last time i checked an hour or so ago is down four thousand bucks i think within the day you know so there's fluctuation at what point do you value your thousand dollar bill at the moment of payment so it's basically because we're flipping it you know almost immediately you know i mean there there might be a 10 minute market risk which we're fine with you know it, it's not a big practical matter so if you're getting ready so let's say you're 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 not our very best client and it's taking you a while to get around to paying that thousand dollars you know at the time you actually make the payment We'll do the conversion, so it really wouldn't be that different than if you if you wanted to pay us in pound sterling, and we would accept the pound sterling, and then the pound sterling went up or down after the payment. That's our risk, not your risk, and it's our job to convert the Bitcoin or the Ether. It's really, and I would really encourage people. 
not that many people want to do it, but it's also not that difficult. There are also companies out there. BitPay is a well-known company, and they'll facilitate the entire process for you. So you never even see the Bitcoin. You don't have to deal with the Bitcoin. You know, you just say, oh, you know, pay my service provider, and then they handle everything. So for a handful of companies that want to do that, it's, it's pretty easy. It's really a low-lift kind of thing. So for those out there that may not be that familiar with blockchain, with cryptocurrency, this area. Let's talk about that. Number one is if you run into somebody at a party and they ask what you do and you say, well, I'm a lawyer and I focus on blockchain. How do you explain what blockchain is? Yeah, boy, that's a, you know, it's a tricky one. Um, there are a, a lot of different explanations and, and trying to boil it down into a very, very short one is, of course, uh, challenging. But broadly speaking, blockchain is the name that we have come to use for any technology that provides a process for updating the state of a ledger without relying on a single trusted party. So you might have a, you know, a ledger of anything. And in fact, if we use the Bitcoin ledger as a paradigm, all it is, is, is just broadly speaking, two columns. One column is public address, and it's just a number. And another column is the number of Bitcoins, which are technically unspent transaction outputs, which are known as UT. XOs and UTXOs are the, the functional unit that are used, but it's just a, a number, right? it's a numeral. So you have an address and you have a number, and that, that if you took all the addresses and the amount of Bitcoin that they held, that would be the state of the ledger at any given point, right? You know, A has 10 and B has 6 and C has 12, whatever it may be. The blockchain is a system by which that ledger can be updated to a new state. In the case of Bitcoin, it happens to be approximately every 10 minutes. There are reasons for that. And then um, people transact with each other. So A sends 2 to B, B sends 3 to C, whatever it may be. And that happens in this 10-minute window. And then at the end of the 10 minutes, there's a new state of the ledger, and it shows the output of that. And it's just simply a way of keeping track of that. So that's basically what blockchain does. And it does that through a consensus protocol that you've, you've probably heard about. Um, uh, technically speaking, the consensus protocol is the means by which everybody who's running a node or participating in this distributed ledger keeps track of things. And one of the important things in Bitcoin that everybody kind of focuses on is the idea of mining. For the sake of this conversation, you can tell me if you agree with this, a ledger is not unlike a spreadsheet or a database. It is quite like it. In fact, yes, what it is. But so instead of updating this ledger, this spreadsheet on your computer, or if you use AWS or a server or whatever, it is updated on the blockchain for everyone to see. And so instead of AWS processing this update to the spreadsheet, or ledger, or instead of your computer doing it, these nodes you're talking about, third parties, they're processing it and making a permit record on this ledger or what we call spreadsheet database, noting the transactions. Is that, is that a good layman's way of explaining what's going on? Yes, broadly. But I'd call out one thing. You used a phrase that is commonly used, which is it's updated on the blockchain. And the definite article there implies something that's really not the case. There's not the blockchain each computer has its own ledger. They synchronize with each other, and we call the process, blockchain is more of a process than it is a, a definitive article. So I run a copy of the, the Bitcoin ledger, so do you, so do you know about, I don't know, 5,000 or 10,000 uh, folks out there. They all run that. The blockchain is the process by which blocks of data or the state of that ledger is updated from time to time in a way that's synchronous. Everybody else knows that if you run it, I know that your copy is the same as my copy. It's not that there's one copy. It's that we all have a mathematical means of knowing that each of our copies are the same as the other one. Yeah, that's actually a great distinction. That, that is the beauty of it is that's how it keeps the blockchain honest is because we've got to make sure if you and I are nodes that our, our information is the same. I have to know with certainty exactly that your node and everyone else's node is the same as my node. And it does that in a very, very clever way. To take it one step a little bit further, although people have been expanding upon what the Bitcoin blockchain can do, probably what's gotten the most attention over the last you know, five years-ish, four years, is Ethereum. And Ethereum is also a process, and it has similarities to Bitcoin, but it has one very, very fundamental difference. And that is... Since, you know, a blockchain acts as a ledger, it can act as a ledger for anything. It can act as a ledger for numbers, but it also can act as a ledger for computer code. 
So if you imagine the same thing, but you have each computer shares its state with all the other nodes. And so when one computer runs the, a program and produces an output, you know that all the other computers in the same way are producing the same output. This allows you to use what's sometimes called a, a virtual computer or virtual machine, and people refer to the Ethereum virtual machine. So it allows me to run a program on my computer and know that you're running the same program and having the same output in the same way that the state of your ledger was the same. But this this allows you to produce extremely complex and fascinating arrangements since you can do virtually anything with computer code. And that's what allows these non-fungible tokens, these decentralized finance, and all these other uh, things are possible because each node runs the same program at the same time and deterministically produces the same output. So let's talk about that. You mentioned Ethereum. Ethereum is a blockchain. Bitcoin has its own blockchain. I think a lot of people you say blockchain, they immediately think cryptocurrency, they're interchangeable. They think, or they think Bitcoin is it. Draw the distinction there. Draw the distinction of what Bitcoin is versus another blockchain like Ethereum. One of the things inherent in the term blockchain, it's, it's worth noting, and for any of your listeners who are intrigued by this, and I hope some are, I highly recommend going out and downloading the original Satoshi Nakamoto white paper for Bitcoin. It's quite readable. It's only about eight pages. And it really, there's nothing better in anything to go back to the original source material, not listening to me or anyone else describe these things. So I, I, would, I would strongly encourage that. So I, what I was going to say was that in the Satoshi white paper, he never actually uses the word blockchain conjoined as if it was one word, uh, which is kind of interesting in itself. So we don't really have a definition. Blockchain is not, you know, there's not some canonical definition. What is a blockchain, right? But it, what it's come to mean is this system rather than a thing, but the system in which uh, the state of a database is updated. So therefore, if that's what a blockchain is, it's a system by which a database is updated. There may be many, many different databases, many, many different ledgers, and they're updated in different ways at different times. So the Bitcoin ledger maintains a record of addresses and amounts. The Ethereum blockchain maintains a record of similar addresses and amounts, but also this underlying code. And it, it also records addresses in a, in a different way. And then there are many others. There's the, uh, recently the Solana blockchain has attracted a lot of attention, but there are many others as well. There's probably, you know, at least six or seven, you know, reasonably important layer one or first tier um, blockchains. And they all have different ledgers that are unique to those blockchain networks. It's better, I would say, Chad, it's just to refer to blockchain network. You'd, you'd get a better and more accurate sense rather than a blockchain or the blockchain. It's a blockchain network. And the distinction, too, is with Bitcoin, it's as of right now, I know they're working to change that. It's basically, it, it's like a currency. It's a, it's a store of value that can be exchanged. Whereas Ethereum is built for some other stuff, specifically smart contracts to run these the computer code, these applications, dApps as they're called, as you mentioned there. That, that's the distinction at this point, right? That's a, a critical uh, distinction. People are working on, on different tools that can be added. There was something called the Taproot update for Bitcoin recently, and in theory allows more things like programmability. But if you talk to someone who's what, what's referred to as a Bitcoin maximalist, they, they have Bitcoin maximalists are very, um, I feel very strongly that the Bitcoin blockchain network is the perfect one and, and all the others are messed up and inherently flawed and should be ignored. And, you know, that's everybody's got a view. But the ability to run smart contracts, which Ethereum shares with Solana, uh, Tezos, Avalanche, uh, Polkadot, and a number of others, that is a very fundamental difference. And it introduces challenges as well, which are complex, but um, that's, that's a fundamental difference. Many of these networks use a process for ensuring that the blockchain is protected. And you mentioned cryptocurrency. And what makes Bitcoin so fascinating is that the unit, the Bitcoin unit, serves two purposes. Um, it helps protect the network and it creates an in, a kind of an inherent internal economic um, system that allows the whole network to propagate. So each time a new block is created, Bitcoins, new Bitcoins are, are, are created by the protocol and awarded to whoever is operating the node that actually validated that next block. And so creating an economic incentive internal to the system. Why would you plug a computer into the wall and run it and spend time protecting this network if you're not rewarded? But who's going to reward you if it's a decentralized system? If Bob's going to reward you, well, then Bob's running the system and Bob can decide when he wants to stop rewarding you. So it's inherently necessary 
that any decentralized blockchain network have an internal digital asset to provide the reward that's necessary to induce people to devote real-world resources to that network. That's mining, Bitcoin mining. They get rewarded for mining. Right. It's, it's the, the effort that uh, occurs in the real world, consuming real electricity, consuming real computing equipment, and that's done to protect the network, to make it somewhere between difficult and nigh on impossible to attack the network in, in some way. And although many people talk about hacking um, in the context of a wallet, so I have a wallet that may hold um, some Bitcoin, we can talk about what that means, but the network itself has never been hacked, never been challenged, and it's it's just about impossible. It's not, nothing is impossible in this world, but uh, just about so. We don't have to need to get too deep into this one because this can get a little crazy. But So distinguish the way Bitcoin is mined from a proof of stake. The, the way transactions are confirmed on other blockchain networks. The key element that's shared between uh, mining in which computing power is used to protect the network and proof of stake is the means by which there is an economic loss that would be associated by someone associated with an attack on the network. That it has to be more expensive to alter the network in a way that's not consistent with what everybody thinks the correct state of the network is. It has to be more expensive than it's worth to attack it. So it's a, it's a game theoretical process as much as anything else. In Bitcoin, you assure that by causing people to expend so much energy to validate blocks that it's not worth it to expend that energy to attack the network. This is a simplified version. In proof of stake, by way of contrast, we don't use any energy at all. You take the native token, the native digital asset of a proof of stake based network, and you put it at risk. You say, I'm going to risk some of my marbles. And if you figure out that I didn't validate this network, I didn't cause the state to update in a way that everyone else agrees with, you get to take my marbles away. And so that I put that at risk. That's my stake. I'm saying I have this economic interest, which is some of the native token, and I'm putting it at risk to validate my you know, goodwill in correctly updating uh, the network. So it's a different system. It's a very different system, but it requires very little you know, energy. You're, no, you're not doing compute power to do that. You just have to have some of the digital asset and put it into a system uh, where it, it can be at risk. And that does require the use of smart contracts. And so it, it's, it's the Bitcoin system is not really amenable to proof of stake uh, in its current form. And like the Bitcoin miners make Bitcoin for doing the mathematical problems, proof of stake validators also make whatever that native token. Exactly right. So a validator, as you usually refer to in proof of stake, a validator will put at risk some of their native tokens, will perform the process of reviewing the transactions that are proposed. Nothing stops me if I have, you know, uh, five Ether in my account and I try and send you 10 Ether. There's nothing that stops me from sending that instruction to the network of computers operating uh, the Ethereum network. However, so I can do that, I can send it out there, but whoever is validating the block that that transaction uh, contains will look at that and say, hmm, you know, by computer, of course, you know, Lewis only has five ETH in his account. He's attempting to send 10 ETH. That's no good. Chuck that one out of here. So for every different state of ledger, and the Ethereum ledger updates about every 10 seconds, so somebody's computer has to look at all the proposed transactions, throw out the bad ones, keep the good ones. And again, to provide those resources, they have to be rewarded. They risk, they're not risking electricity, they're not risking the cost, they're risking losing their existing Ether, and their potential gain is that if they correctly validate a block, they'll get a reward of more Ether. When we come back, Lewis is going to talk about some of the newer uses of blockchain technology like NFTs and DAOs. We finish up our conversation with a discussion about the current regulatory environment in the crypto world. This podcast is brought to you by Percipient, a legal services company powered by technology. Percipient helps legal teams tackle legal operations, electronic document review, and process automation. Percipient services include managed document review, subpoena compliance, cyber incident response, and also helps legal teams provide clients with process-driven legal support. To learn more, visit percipient.co. Percipient. Legal services powered by technology. We'll get back to my conversation with Lewis Cohen in just a second. But before I do, and as I always do, 
I want to encourage you to check out tlpodcast.com. There we have an episode webpage for every episode we do with more information about our guests and links to some of the stuff we talk about. This is a great episode to check out because Lewis and I are talking about a lot of stuff and we put a bunch of links in there. Also, if you want to subscribe, you can pretty much find us wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like us enough, if you like hearing these stories and you like learning about this legal tech, I hope you tell a friend and give us a positive rating. All right, let's get back to my conversation with Lewis Cohen. Let's talk about some of these uses. Um, it's been all the rage lately, the non-fungible token, the NFTs. But before you get on into talking about their uses and what, what's, what's distinguish what they are, a fungible token like an ETH versus a, a non-fungible token. Sure. Well, you pretty much, the nice part is you summed it right up there. So in theory, at least, the non-fungible token is a unique one of one. It's the only one of its type. Whereas a fungible token, there may be, you know, millions, if not billions of them that are all functionally the same. And one way of thinking about them is a little bit like dollar bills. You know, as far as we're concerned, each dollar bill is fungible with each other one. They might have a slightly different serial number on it. One might be a little bit more worn than the next, but we're indifferent to those distinctions and we treat them all as fungible. An artwork, of course, would be an example of something that's non-fungible. Picasso may have painted, you know, whatever, a thousand paintings in his life, but each one is distinct from the others. Some have much more value than, than the others. So dollar bills are all fungible, even if they may have very, very minor uh, distinctions among them. Picasso paintings are non-fungible. Each one is unique in and of themselves. However, Picasso may have, and in fact did, create posters. So he may have created a run of 10 posters, signed them all, but they're identical to each other, right? So those we still generally categorize when a non-fungible token is one of 10 or even one of 100, we would still usually categorize those as non-fungible, even though within their set, there is fungibility among them, right? So in the, if you think about the signed Picasso posters, you're pretty indifferent. So if someone, you know, you, you bought one and someone swapped out the other ones, you couldn't tell the difference and you really wouldn't really care. The problem, of course, intellectually you get into as well, well, if it's one of 10 or one of 100, well, still, that's very different from one of a million. But what if Picasso ran off you know, a million copies of a particular thing? Well, that's not very non-fungible anymore. These are one of the many, many puzzles that you know come up. But broadly speaking, fungible is where you're indifferent as to any given one of that unit. Non-fungible is when there's a level of uniqueness that you know merits saying these are different from those, even if the these is more than one strictly. The most common use case is art a video or a, a digital image that's created, whatever it is. And if someone goes to OpenSea or Rarible, some of these other, these other sites and buys one, but that particular image is connected to a block on the blockchain network. And if the person buys it, then their address or wallet's associated with it. So everybody can see they own this one particular, one of 10 or whatever it is, this, this non-fungible token. Right. On Ethereum, uh, tokens are created with smart contracts, which are which are bits of code. And in particular, a standard was developed some years ago uh, by a company called Dapper Labs, and it's known by the number of of, of its proposal. So it's um, uh, known as ERC seven twenty one. And that's just a standard. And um, again, people are interested. It's not that hard to actually look at the code and, and kind of get a feel for it. And I, I strongly encourage people to do that because if you're going to be a lawyer in the space and you're not willing to kind of roll up your sleeves and, and, and look at code, you know, that's not, not ideal. So the 721 standard is just a bit about, you know, in its most simple form, about eight to 10 lines of code, something like that. And it's got various uh, fields in effect. And one of the fields is called token ID. And the token ID field then uh, carries a subject, um, an object in that field that can be any sort of uniform resource um, indicator. So it could be, for example, a website address or some other thing. So what the token does is, is the token is a, you know created by the smart contract code, and the smart contract code will point to a resource elsewhere. Generally speaking, you can, in theory, embed some kinds of metadata or artwork into the token. Let's ignore that for the time being. It's a little more complicated. But the point is that what you're buying when you buy a digital asset is really what you get is the ability to give an instruction to the blockchain network as to where to send it next. And the ability to identify yourself as the person, the only person who can give that instruction, getting really legal for a moment because we haven't talked that much law. 
the Uniform Commercial Code governs many, of course, commercial transactions, as commercial lawyers will know. Um, there's a process ongoing right now through the Uniform Law Commission and the American Law Institute working together, uh, the ULC ALI, to draft a new article to the Uniform Commercial Code. It would be a new Article 12. And new Article 12 would be specifically for a new type of asset uh, called a controllable electronic record. So, uh, you know, we've had, uh, for example, electronic chattel paper for some time. This really is a, a major expansion on that and trying to recognize as a matter of commercial law, as a matter of state law, what exactly we're talking about. And, and I think the Uniform Law Commission team that did it did a fantastic job. I'll call out my good friend, Drew Hinkus, if he's ever going to listen, because he was one of a, a large group of folks who, who worked on it and, and did a great job. And, and so this idea is, what do you own when you own an NFT? Just circling us back, right? What do you own? You have a controllable electronic record. You can tell the Ethereum blockchain as to this particular smart contract send this to another address. That's what you have. You have the ability to give an instruction that the network will follow. The ownership is really that you are the only one who can give an instruction as to this token or digital asset. The token just points at a resource. So for example, in the most easy uh, to understand case, if the, the website was taken down, so you got a 404 not found, you'd still own the digital asset, but you wouldn't be pointing at anything. You'd, just, you'd be pointing at 404 not found, which would be really kind of depressing. So the ownership of the token does not have anything to do directly with the ownership of what the metadata is, the thing that you're pointing at. Now, separately, by buying the token, let's assume hopefully, that the person um, who's selling you the token controls the copyright of the work in question. They may give you a license, and they may also undertake to you that they're only giving you the license to have that particular work associated with the token and to display that work, you know, at least in a non-commercial way. That's why one of the reasons I want to bring you on, because when the NFT craze first hit, it's been around for a while, but it really hit earlier this year, you go on Twitter, and even some pretty knowledgeable people were saying crazy stuff about NFTs, and you hit the nail on the head of copyright. I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, but th there were certain people out there that kind of were on the belief that if I buy an NFT of a song or an artwork, that I control every piece of intellectual property to that artwork, but that's not the case. So at a minimum, what should a lawyer know about what you own, the rights owned to an NFT? Would you keep it simple with a, to a piece of artwork? Or a piece of music. Well, you know, the, the starting point, of course, is ensuring that who's ever selling the rights actually controls the rights to begin with. So that's a, that's an important starting point. So that involves its own inquiry as to how exactly do we know it was the person, the creator, or do they have themselves a license to use it? So that's the, the first place. Um, as uh, I'm sure you know, Chad, obviously, um, copyright, like many things, are, are referred to sometimes as a bundle of sticks. You could break them up into a lot of different pieces. And so you look to the legal agreement, which does need to exist as a legal agreement, which is the license, in which to say which of those bundle of sticks that a copyright owner has. Now, we've established that the seller of the token is the copyright owner. So which rights are they giving you? Now, in some cases, people are sloppy and they didn't really say what rights they were giving, and that can create confusion that down the line, I think at this point, people have kind of figured out that that's not such a good idea. And so they're creating a separate license. And so as a lawyer, you want to examine, or if you're representing the NFT seller, you want to create a license that makes sense under the circumstances. Licenses to date have been pretty constrained in terms of what the purchaser or the licensee can actually do with that. And generally speaking, it's limited to non-commercial display. But I think an interesting area in the NFT space is actually expanding that out a little bit more broadly and seeing what can become of that. You know, For example, if there are two very similar artworks, one carried a license that was much more broad than the other, would the broader licensed NFT actually sell for a higher price? Because someone says to you, wow, I could do more things with this. So so I think we're still very much in the earliest of early stages and in a voyage of discovery. But I think as a lawyer in the space, you know, you want to think about, you know, the, these kind of issues. So let's switch gears a little bit. DAOs, D-A-O, what are they? So the idea here is that you've got a decentralized, autonomous organization. And this is a group of humans Although in theory, I guess you could get some AIs to work together, who knows, but let's just assume for the moment it's a group of humans, and they agree to organize themselves using smart contract code, and that smart contract code automates their relationships with each other, at least to some extent. So a decentralized autonomous organization is like, again, a company or a business of some sort that runs itself 
without or with limited human input. For example, there may be human input for voting. Perhaps the most famous DAO was the DAO with a capital T, which was created in 2016 and uh, imploded when uh, there was an exploit or a weakness in the underlying smart contract code that allowed um, the ether that was being stored to be kind of drained off to another location. But basically, uh, a DAO is any kind of arrangement among multiple people that is governed at least in part through uh, contract code. The, the challenge is, is how do we as lawyers look at that arrangement among these people? And if there's no other document that sets out what that arrangement is, then the law will generally look at that as a general partnership. If there's a commercial venture among two or more people and it's not otherwise documented, generally speaking, the default is going to be a general partnership. That's a very bad outcome because, uh, of course, as, as I think many of your listeners will know, in a general partnership, each partner is uh, severally liable and jointly liable for all the debts of the entirety of the partnership. So that's a, a very bad result. Now, can you find that person? Can you get jurisdiction over that person? And then can you actually enforce against that person? Well, that remains to be seen. But I think few people want to put themselves in the position of being generally liable for the debts of a group of people who they don't know and don't know what they're doing or what kind of trouble they're making. Under tax law, there are issues as well. A publicly traded partnership is a concept in the United States that generally speaking is a partnership that has more than, I believe, 100 um, separate people and trades on an exchange. And since the tokens that are used to represent the relationship in the DAO can publicly trade, you may have a of a publicly traded partnership for tax rules, which also has very adverse consequences. So, you know, for lawyers, this is not an area to, to dabble in like at all. So to become involved in a DAO, you need to get the DAO's token, whatever that is, so you can vote. So instead of like shareholders voting based on the number of shares they have, or if it is an LLC or a partnership based on their, their how much of that entity they own, you vote with these tokens. And so is a, a way of looking at this is a DAO is, I don't this kind of loaded word, some sort of organization entity that's on the blockchain and governed by smart contracts. One way I try and sometimes explain this to folks is if you think about a fan club. A fan club is a loosely organized group of people that share a common interest. Let's say Britney Spears. We're all you know, very concerned about Britney, and we, we hope she's doing better these days and whatnot. So we have some common interest. We may or may not have some common economic goals, but we kind of come and go as we see fit. We may vote on what we're going to get Britney for Christmas, you know, because really we're so happy that she's doing better these days or whatever it may be. But it's a very loose affiliation of people that share some interest or another in common and have some economics associated with that. And that's just kind of a way, you know, it's not as strange a concept as you might think that people loosely organize around a common interest. Social tokens, not unlike a fan club, is one of the more mature, not the great word, but it's, it's a more prominent use case of these DAOs right now. Yes, absolutely. So people do that. There's there's a range of uses. I, personally, the, the my main kind of talking point, folks who know me, when I talk about DAOs is simply this, that, you know, we're a group of individuals have strong feelings about something and are willing to invest the time, it's actually an interesting kind of social arrangement. But where financial matters arise, most people like you know, sort of delegating management. You know, as I, as I say, when you, you come home from work and it's like 7.30 and, and you want to have a pizza and a beer and maybe watch something on Netflix, you probably don't want to fire up the computer and start reading about voting on some DAO decision unless you care quite a lot about it, right? And so, you know, I think DAOs are fantastic, but they are somewhat constrained in terms of the number of individuals that are involved and also what their objectives are. So things like a religious group might be very, very well suited to that. People who share something in common in a relatively defined way. But just to say, like, I've got a financial DAO, it, it, you say, well, why isn't that a company? Because you want it, it inevitably you will delegate decision making to some small group of people because you don't want to do it yourself in almost every case. And at that point, you just say, well, why don't you just have a company and have the benefits of limited liability, et cetera? And I thought a lot about that, the small group of people at the end of the day needing to make decisions. Can that be accomplished in a DAO? 
Well, it can. I mean, you could use it. So you could automate this process. And there are circumstances where I think it absolutely can facilitate those sort of arrangements, especially where you don't have to trust somebody to keep track of what's going on. So, we, you know, we're all voting. We all know how we voted and what the outcome was. And nobody was messing around with that. You didn't have to go tell Bob, who's my, my victim of, of this podcast, you know, you have to, you know, and then Bob's keeping track. Are you sure, Bob? I, I don't know if that's what the vote was there. Uh, could you check that again? We don't have that, right? So we have absolutely deterministic voting and other, you know, arrangements. Also, you know, maybe it's in homeowner setting, right? It's, you know, there's all kinds of, of settings like that. The current regulatory environment. So for a long time, crypto didn't necessarily fly under the radar, but it didn't get as much attention from the government. SEC's looking at it. Other governmental agencies are foreign and d- domestic. What's going on now? What's the current state of things? I have some fairly strongly held views. I, you know, those, by the way, who are interested, of course, I'm dropping this in the middle, but you feel free to follow me on Twitter, which is at NY Crypto Lawyer. And you can put that in the description there. You know, I comment on this, you know, a fair amount. I've written about it in a scholarly article. You know, the Howey test, which many of your listeners may have heard of at this point if they're interested in this topic, is how the Supreme Court defined the term investment contract, which was used in the Securities Act of 1933, but never defined. So we needed a definition. It was basically imported from state law that had preceded uh, the federal securities laws. And in the case of um, SEC versus W.J. Howey, the Supreme Court enunciated basically a four-part test. And That test really addresses what I think many of us can recognize is a very important policy position, which is if the only things that are securities are those that hold themselves out as securities, then it might be possible for, you know, promoters who are either sloppy or actually malicious to create schemes for investments that themselves are not labeled stock, labeled bond, labeled preferred stock, or whatever it may be, a trust certificate, but nevertheless have the economics of an investment. And so the uh, court in Howey said, let's just make it clear, even where the parties don't hold themselves out as creating a security, maybe the nature when examined of their economic relationships is much more like a security. And so that is where there's an investment of money um, in a common enterprise where the people investing have a reasonable expectation of making a profit primarily from the efforts of the others with whom they're investing. And, and with those four factors are present, generally speaking, the Supreme Court's guidance is then you've got, even if they don't they never label this as, as a security, it could be a sale of real estate, could be sale of beavers, whiskey, all kinds of different underlying schemes. But at the end of the day, what's really happening is people are putting money in, they're expecting somebody else to do something with it, and they're hoping to get more back later. That's basically it. When digital assets came along, they were used to raise money. And in many ways, that fundraising fit that paradigm very, very well, right? So I've created a bunch of tokens. I go to you, Chad. I say, you know, if you buy 100,000 of these tokens for 10 cents each, just wait till you see what this network does. It's going to go crazy. 10 cents each. They're going to be worth 50 bucks each, 100 bucks each. How can you say no? Let's just hurry up and buy. Come on, come on, come on. Give me the money. And this is, of course, what happened particularly in 2017 and 18, where, you know, as some digital assets started to increase dramatically in value, people pitched more and more schemes. Many of them were ludicrous. A fair share of them were fraudulent. And monies were raised. Monies were taken in. Something was given. It was nominally not a securities transaction. But when you look and when um, the former chair of the SEC, Jay Clayton, said, every ICO I see pretty much looks like a security, this is what he's referring to, this economic arrangement wherein I sell you something. You don't really want the token. What you want is to make a profit and, you know, by disposing it later at a higher price. And you're expecting me to, in some way or another, create that profit. So that's pretty clear. That's the part that's clear. The part that's not clear is probably the most important part. What exactly is it that is the security? Now, until digital assets came along, it was pretty clear that what it was was security was this economic arrangement between the buyer and the seller, disguised investment uh, scheme. It wasn't the beavers or the whiskey or the real estate or any of those things. Those were the object of the scheme, but they were not the security. Right? Nobody would suggest that. The, the asset nominally sold that nobody really cared that much about is not a security. It's an asset of some type or another. When digital assets, when tokens came along, the SEC said, well, you know, we think that investment scheme kind of tags along with the asset and keeps going as it's sold and resold 
and resold. And we think, functionally, that the digital asset is itself a security. And this is really where the great debate is lying, because if the digital asset itself carries its securityness around with it, at least for some period of time, then all the major you know, digital asset exchanges like Coinbase and Gemini and Kraken and all these others, they're all violating the law because they're all should be registered exchanges of securities. And in fact, you know, the SEC chair has, has very directly you know, asserted that. I don't believe that's a correct reading of the law, and I think it's very problematic, but it does expose a kind of weakness in the way the law is structured because previously in all these other schemes that predated digital assets, be it the, the, the whiskey and the, the beavers and all these other things, there was never a robust secondary market in whatever the thing was that was being sold, so you never really had to think about it. I don't think it's correct to say that the scheme follows the asset, but I do think we need to think harder about how to address people who can raise money on the prospect of selling some fungible asset into a liquid secondary market and use that to raise their money. So that is really probably the most important legal issue facing the digital asset space right now. If all digital assets are functionally securities, none of this is going to work. And I don't think that's the right result. I don't think it's the right policy result. I don't think it's the right legal result. But we do need to address these issues in some way or another. But I did see on Twitter, speaking of Twitter, I think I saw one of your tweets say some level of registration slash regulation is good for the environment overall. So what are you thinking there? Why is it good for uh, blockchain networks and crypto? Because those who raise money through the sale of an asset that's not a security, but can trade widely, I think do have a responsibility to the market to provide information about what they're doing and how they're doing it. So I don't disagree with the SEC about the result, but I disagree vehemently about the means they are attempting to get at the result. The SEC wants to get at that result through imputing securityness onto an asset. The problem with that is if you're a third person, you're a third party, how are you supposed to know whether any given digital asset is or is not a security? You have no way, you can't examine it and look at it and say, oh, looks like a security to me. And that's what's caused all this consternation. So I think there are other ways of actually getting the person who's responsible here, which is the person that raised the money, to provide information to the market without necessarily attributing securityness onto an asset that's plainly not a security. So if you've got attorneys out there or just anybody in general that want to get up to speed or at least start digging into legal issues related to blockchain networks and, and cryptocurrency, what do you suggest they do? What did you do when you were starting out? I read a lot, to be honest. I read everything I could get my hands on and just talk to people. I think it's really important. This is an area where you've really got to know the underlying technology and how it works, especially where we use a lot of metaphors, coin, token, chain, uh, wallet, all these words that, you know, those are just metaphors for code and things that happen. And I think as a lawyer, if you rely on those words, you won't really, those metaphors, you won't really understand what's actually going on here. And I think that's like really, really important. So I would say the starting point is just to dive in and start learning. I think what my experience has been, Chad, is that that's not a difficult assignment because those who are interested, you know, just inevitably find themselves what I I refer to as the Friday night syndrome, where it's Friday at about 1130 and you're in bed and your partner, whoever that may be, is like, honey, turn out the light. And you're like, one more article, one more YouTube video, one more thing. You know, when you, when you reach that point where you're so interested, you've got to learn more. And I think it comes very naturally for most folks. And if you, if you are that way, you know, dive in. I think there's so much, don't feel in any way, shape or form, that you're too late. We're at the earliest stages, not the late stages. There's plenty of time to become a world-leading expert, start learning, start engaging, go on Twitter, you know, write stuff on Medium, you know, contribute to the discussion and uh, comment on this podcast and and just become part of a community. I think that's really exciting and it's a great place to be. Louis, thanks for your time. You've already mentioned your Twitter handle, but let's say it again. And if people want to get a hold of you elsewhere, how do they do it? Sure. Thanks, Chad. So again, on Twitter, I'm NY Crypto Lawyer. So NY, I can't spell Crypto Lawyer. You can spell it for yourself. And 
And our website, our law firm website is www.dlxlaw, D as in David, L's and Larry, X is in xylophone, www.dlxlaw.com. There's plenty of information there. There's a bunch of our writings and things like that. And um, I can also be reached at my work email, which is Lewis, L-E-W-I-S dot Cohen, C-O-H-E-N, at dlxlaw.com. And thank you, Chad, for your time. You're a great interviewer. Appreciate it. And uh, really appreciate your sharing a little time with me. That's it for today. I appreciate you listening. If you want to get a hold of me, you can find me on LinkedIn or email me at cmain at recipient.co. That's C-M-A-I-N at recipient.co. If you want to subscribe, you can find us pretty much wherever you find podcasts. And while you're there, I hope you give us a good rating. Until next time, this has been Technically Legal.